which is trying to imagine how we destigmatize po poverty, which is quite, as you can imagine, a challenge. So I think it's important to say that certainly from my perspective or diagnosis, the current conjuncture that we're in is characterized by ultra nationalism, xenophobia, uh, deepening poverty, increasing inequalities of wealth and health. And I think in terms of mainstream politics, I don't think there's any substantive alternatives to neoliberal capitalism or permanent austerity in sight in, in, um, as far as I can see right now. Working with what I would call communities of resistance has helped me better understand the role of stigma and shaming and what I would call stigma politics in contributing to and legitimating and enabling the crisis, the sort of permanent crisis, I think, that we're currently in. OK. And what I want to think about is not just that diagnosis, although I'm going to focus on that to begin with, but I want, perhaps it's helpful for you to be thinking about what anti-stigma practices we might imagine in a way in response to this. What, what would it mean to build relational, destigmatized systems of welfare that center care, that reject shame, that fight for freedom, equality and human flourishing? So that's a kind of utopian horizon, if you like, that the diagnosis is supposed to help us contribute to thinking about. So my, my, my most recent book that's on the screen now that came out in 2020, attempted to rethink the role of stigma in reproducing inequalities of wealth, health and more. And it was the thesis of this book that in order to counter the kind of vigorous and relentless assault upon human dignity, that I think is a major characteristic of the global authoritarian turn, we actually require a new understanding of stigma, how stigma is propagated top down as a governmental technology of division and dehumanization, the role played by stigma politics in producing a kind of climates of fear and hatred and that I think we can see in lots of spheres that divide communities and societies. How is stigma power crafted and cultivated as a means of leveraging political capital? And how does this sort of stigma, power, politics get under people's skin in ways that changes the ways in which people think about themselves and think about other groups? How does it corrode compassion, crush hope and weaken social solidarity? So basically, one of the aims of this book was to try and produce a new understanding of stigma as a form of power that feeds, amplifies and legitimates inequalities of health and wealth. When I was thinking, I've just finished being head of department, so I'm only just really returning to research in the last um, six or eight months. And I was reflecting on the kind of longer trajectory of my research, thinking what my, what's my big thing gonna be next I'm gonna focus on. And when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about this concern with stigma power and stigma politics and how, in a way, it's been a connecting thread through the major part of my academic career. So I think this theme is pretty present and live also in my 2013 book and subsequent publications, um, which I used there the terms abjection and particularly developed an I the idea of social abjection um, to tank kind of understand these similar processes, but also, again, thinking about how do people resist and revolt against their classification as other, as less than human, as abject? How do minoritised populations that are imagined and configured as revolting and become subject to control, stigma and censure resist individually and as groups and revolt against that classification or protect themselves from it? And I think, particularly in my books, um, there's also a way in which I write where I try to um, think about how I can move um, the reader to revolt in a way to make people see differently and provoke the desire to do something about it. 
got a message saying you can't see the slides. Can you all let me know if that's the case? Can you see the slides, Lena? Yeah, I can see them fine. Yeah. yeah. OK, so that's a just sense of who I am and kind of this thread in my work around stigma, power, resistance, revolt and this development I've, over my career of a kind of theoretical toolkit or an attempt to develop a theoretical toolkit <laughs> with which allows us to think more intersectionally and more historically about changing forms of capitalism, systems of power, social control, social classification. And the communities I work with outside of academia um, as a kind of public sociologist or activist have really essential, been an essential part of grounding and motivating my work. But one time I want to focus on today is the poverty emergency we're currently living through in the UK, which is a crisis of welfare. Um, I've done a bit of work tracing the history of poverty stigma, um, drawing of other people's work, the work of historians and others. And you're talking about a 500 year history. In a way, there is no welfare without stigma. And there's something quite British about the stigmatization of social relief. But I'm not going to do the whole 500 years. You'll be glad to know. I'm going to focus on this period of austerity, which is about 15 years now. Um, and my kind of argument is if we want to abolish poverty in the UK, and I think that should be what we are demanding and should be the horizon, there's actually no reason for uh, a country like the UK to have the levels of poverty and destitution that it has. So if we think of, in a way, abolition of poverty as a horizon, then I think what we need to do is think about a wholesale destigmatization of welfare. And I think actually thinking about poverty through an abolitionist lens is a productive thing to do. So, what does destigmatizing welfare mean? It would mean thinking, as I'll talk about at the end of the talk, about how we fund, design, social provision, health, and other public services. But to begin with, it would involve a task transforming what I would call the public welfare imaginary, reclaiming welfare in effect. So I want to begin in winter that's just passed, winter 2022, and a visit and a, some notes I made and an interview that I did with a friend called, I'm going to call Jim. So I went to visit Jim who and he'd unscrewed all the light bulbs in his flat. Um, this is in the uh, context of what the press term, um, politicians term the cost of living crisis and escalating uh, fuel costs. He'd unplugged his fridge, he turned off his central heating for the foreseeable. He, boil, he boils a kettle once a day to fill a flask of tea, which he says sees him through till bed. His meals consist mainly of tin food from a food bank reheated in a microwave donated through a council hardship fund. He shows me an electric blanket he'd received in the post from his sister, but he doesn't, he says he doesn't dare turn it on. Jim is a disabled ex-veteran in his early 60s and a prolific anti-poverty campaigner. I'd known him since about 2017 when we worked together on a local poverty truth commission during a period when austerity cuts to state welfare had left many in our community struggling. And four years later, um, as we sit in his freezing cold flat, he's struggling to find words to describe the depth and volume of destitution overwhelming local people's lives, including his own. It is, he says, he pauses and shakes his head, nothing short of a catastrophe. Poverty and destitution are stalking contemporary British society. Relative poverty rates have been largely static in the UK prior, prior to about 2000. In the wake of austerity, Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic, poverty rates and in particular rates of deep poverty and destitution are rapidly increasing. It's been estimated, for example, by Joseph Rowntree that between 2002 and 2020, the number of people living in deep poverty, uh, and you can look how they 
determine that, and I put a graph here, increased by 1.8 million to um, from from 4.7 million to 6.5 million. So around encompassing around 10% of the population and what they term living in deep poverty. Now, the drivers of deepening poverty are multiple. They include factors such as low wages, insecure work, inflationary food and energy prices, shortage of affordable housing, unregulated rental market, etc. They also include draconian citizenship and border controls, which has seen the UK uh, renege on many of its human rights obligations. And in 2022, in the winter of 22, when I was talking to my friend Jim, we're living in this period, as I said, dubbed the cost of living crisis, which is ongoing. And millions more have found themselves and are continuing to find themselves pushed into states of poverty, destitution. Destitution is a state the JRF defines as regularly being unable to afford a basic necessity, such as clothing, food, rent, heating. There are thousands of symptoms of this humanitarian crisis and there are multiple ways to characterise it. But I think hunger would be a key one. And I was struck yesterday by research that showed that the height of children growing up in austerity Britain is significantly reduced. So we're sort of seeing, and I'll return to that, these kind of biosocial symptoms of austerity that we're now seeing in people's bodies. Social scientists and third sector analysts are largely unanimous that the root causes of the current crisis can be tracked back to austerity um, and the programme of reforms that all of you will be familiar with that, that saw the deepest cuts to public spending in the history of the, the modern British state. And as the cradle to grave safety net that was designed, however flawed, by the mid 20th century architects of the British welfare state has been defunded. Conditions, I think, in poorer communities have in many ways and are increasingly coming to resemble the first decades of the 20th century, when many households were dependent on charitable aid. So the normalization of things like food banks, almost unknown in Britain between 1950 and 2010, are now a permanent feature of everyday social relief. Emergency food aid has expanded, you know, out of church halls, community centres, into schools and workplaces. Uh, as we saw this winter, local authorities, faith groups, community groups felt compelled to open warm banks to relieve people unable to heat their homes. Deprivation accumulates in bodies over lifetimes, but the effects of austerity on the health of British citizens is already evident. Diseases of poverty and want rarely recorded in Britain are now returning and there's lots of new NHS data that reveals higher rates of malnutrition, scurvy, rickets, etc. The return of diseases associated with poverty. We also know that around 7 million people, that's, you know, 10 percent of the population are waiting for hospital treatments and surgery. Life expectancy we know is falling for the first time since uh, records began. So social scientists in Glasgow University tried to calculate the number of deaths they could attribute to cuts between 2012 and 2019. Um, and their, their figure was around 300,000. So people are, we know, being disabled and are dying prematurely because of cuts to vital benefits and services that were previously provided by the state. But I think also we need to understand what, what this period marked was a fundamental shift in the meaning of the welfare state. Um, it kind of marked the end of a kind of social contract. It is about the end of the idea in a way or the promise of social mobility and the promise of greater equality of health, education, wealth and opportunity. I'm not going to spend long on this and I've written about this um, quite a lot, but I think it, we we have such short memories and so much has happened. It is important and particularly as Osborne, I think, was speaking to the COVID-19 inquiry yesterday to remember the political language which was used at the time when austerity was being designed. Um, 
And in 2008, Osborne gave a speech to the Conservative Party conference um, before they were elected to the coalition government in 2010. And the speech was called There is a Dependency Culture. And in a way, this speech, I think, really began to outline what you might call the ideology of austerity um, and outline the Conservative Party's economic response to the uh, financial banking crisis, which centred on plans to implement this, what they described as the most far-reaching programme of welfare reform for a generation. And what we see is the emergence of the language of stigma um, around benefits, claimants in particular, uh, really coming to the forefront in this period. He describes millions of people languishing on out-of-work benefits who, who are in effect what is wrong with the British economy. Describes a kind of unproductive residuum of people persistently playing the system, milking the rewards of what he terms as something for nothing culture. So we have this kind of setting up, if you like, of what I would call as the stigma politics of austerity that in 2011 is explicitly called by Cameron, then Prime Minister, a war on welfare. Um, and although they mean, in a way, a war on welfare claimants, as in benefits claimants, actually, I think a war on welfare is kind of what we've had in this period and is a much better way of describing austerity. Um, try and speed up a bit. So the architects of austerity knew that effective stigma craft would be critical to winning public consent for this war. And in effect, into, in order to em, implement austerity, they needed to make the public feel that those in receipt of welfare, but now reimagined as cash benefits, rather than all public services, are not deserving. And so we had this rollout of uh, across the media, rolling news for several years, media, politicians, political speech, journalism, and uh, notably reality TV. This is a kind of orchestrated moral panic that tutored the public to believe that people uh, living in poverty were feckless, that deprivation was a deserved consequence of poor choices and an unwillingness to heart work hard enough. And we see these, what I would call stigma feedback loops emerge in which characters in highly scripted, sensationalised reality television programmes, for example, then circulate across the public sphere and are captured as evidence in support of austerity reforms. And I won't read this, but this is like, you can see these feedback loops happening continuously across the kind of media sphere. Tracy Jensen and I in 2015 tried to track this through a kind of case study and we were looking at the passing of the Welfare Reform Act, which was a major piece of legislation for austerity. And as it passed through Parliament, one of the most controversial elements of this bill was the household benefits cap, which sought to restrict the income that a family on state benefits could receive to the first um, two children. So, um, so the capping of child benefits to a second child. And actually that policy now we know has directly uh, increased child poverty in the UK. So, so we looked at when as an act is going through parliament, what was happening in the, in the wider media sphere. And we saw this explosion of kind of accounts of welfare dependent pa uh, families, the emergence of this term benefits broods to describe poor families with an above average number of children. Um, so it's kind of interesting just to do a case study to look at that stigma relay and to look at these highly selective and often fictionalised media stories about families that kind of accompanied the political progress of austerity through Parliament. So as I kind of flagged at the beginning, there is nothing new about the government of welfare through stigma production from above. These are not new phenomena, although the mediums have obviously changed in which that stigma is communicated or mediated over the centuries. But the cultivation of stigma has always played a pivotal role in the rationing of welfare, 
and in winning consent for kind of periodic attacks on social provision and for drawing distinctions between the deserving and the undeserving poor. And Robert Walker uh, has written about this in his really important work on shame and poverty, how governments employ stigma as a means of rationing benefits, encouraging personal independence. So we know that stigma has always played a role, but I think what we are seeing of austerity is something more of a kind of wholesale attack on kind of particularly on the idea of the welfare state. Um, and John Hills kind of came to this conclusion in 2015, right at the beginning of austerity in his book, Good Times, Bad Times, The Welfare Myth of Them and Us, looking at how social attitudes around welfare had changed and how groups that are normally, nor, um, ordinarily seen as historically seen as deserving, such as children and disabled people, when there was still this hardening of public attitudes, even towards the, there wasn't softening towards those groups, despite the impacts that, that can be seen of austerity. And what he argues, which I kind of agree with, is that there's this contraction going on of the meaning of welfare itself. And we can see that in the political language. So welfare is reimagined through austerity as cash benefits that are unaffordable, that are doled out to economically inactive people, rather than the massive services that actually the welfare state is, health, education, on which the vast majority of us depend. So the term welfare itself and the idea of welfare or the imaginary of welfare is itself become stigmatised through this process. Um, and I think this attention to this kind of uh, the representation or language use or the, and the ideologies is actually really important for us to understand what's happening, how stimulus, stigma is stimulated in order to think about what the challenge is to reimagine welfare in the context, in this context. It's also worth saying that this is not a kind of hidden process. Um, this is absolutely tied to the rise of a kind of neoliberal economic orthodoxy. And a kind of, it's the meeting of that neoliberal orthodoxy, free markets, etc., with a kind of right wing commentary, which call for actually openly the intensification of welfare stigma as a means of slashing the social state. So if you look at the writing of the eugenicist social scientist, Charles Murray, actually he, op he almost has written the blueprint for what then happened in Britain from 2015. He calls stigma the way out, the tool, the device required to break a cradle to grave system of government decided support. And, and um, there's, there's lots of examples like that. So what's the impact of that? So working as a sociologist on issues of poverty and welfare, you encounter shame everywhere and you encounter people who are living in a way in, in response to the interpolative effect of this stigma. The accumulative effect of living in a society where stigma is framing political and media coverage and debate around welfare and poverty and the way in which this all pervasive stigma shapes people's attitudes towards you as a scrounger, as fraudulent and um, as scum, effectively. And, you know, in stigma, I, I, in, I have some interview material with people that I've worked with through Poverty Truth in particular, who talk about what the sort of different scales in which they encounter that stigma from corporate agency, banks, debt companies, agents of the state, job centre officials, private sector, medical professionals employed to assess your right to um, claim disability benefits, etc. And the different kind of uh, social spaces and geographies of stigma where you, where you encounter it, but also the impact of just turning on the radio in your car and there's a television, uh, there's a radio discussion about scroungers phoning in on Five Live or the television programmes that you watch where these reality TVs are being screened and the impact of that cumulatively 
and China Mills, who I know you've has come to speak to you before, really writes brilliantly about austerity as kind of lived as effective force, she says, an atmospheric fear. She describes it as this pervasive psychological and bodily anxiety, shame and anger, differing in intensity at different times, and but fatiguing the body physically and psychologically, wearing people out. And that really correlates with my own experience of working um, with communities. The other side of the kind of poverty propaganda is that, as Tracy Shildrick would call it, is that this kind of stigma optics transforms ways, people's ways of seeing poverty, it hardens people's feelings to the suffering they may see around them. And it changes the way people relate to each other. So it really erodes those structures or, uh, of care and compassion. And, and poverty denialism is still rife. Um, the belief that po real poverty doesn't exist in Britain, that poverty is something that's, for example, in developing world, it isn't really here, not real poverty. Um, and, and you can, you know, there's lots of ways in which you can see what, what that public opinion at work in the public sphere. That's just an example on the slide. In terms of people living in this context, I think what we can see is how stigma shames people into silence, um, how it makes it more difficult to talk about the <laughs> scale of difficulties you may be facing. Um, and I think one of the things through my work with different communities and groups is this, this is an overwhelming feature of the experience of poverty is the shame associated with it and that's almost like an historical constant but it's more intense in these periods of top-down stigma um, the daily humiliations encountered by people living in poverty can actually be as devastating disabling as the misery of material deprivation in the years since I undertook the work some of the work that I've just gone through that some of which is in the stigma book in 2020 the poverty crisis as I said at the beginning is worse been worsened is worsening exacerbated I think by the COVID pandemic the defunding of the NHS I think in particular we're seeing contributing to ill health associated with poverty and this is an interview that I did with Andy did a podcast with him as well as a, um, a GP and public health lead in my own area and he talks about you know what's happening in the health sphere more generally in terms of general practice and primary care but what it also feels like to be a GP in the context of ancillary services as he said closing down so people he describes people pouring through the doors like a tidal wave into primary care but what isn't there anymore what's been kind of eroded and corroded away through the sorts of mechanisms I've been talking about is these additional um, help and support that used to be there in the community those kind of um, other services have just gone there's nothing there there's nowhere to sort of um, point people to and he talks about how this this uses this term shit life syndrome to describe the impact of deepening poverty on his on, on his practices on primary care practice. He says, I don't like that term, but I hear a lot of my colleagues talk about shit life syndrome. The reality is a lot of people come to us simply to say my life is terrible and I don't know what to do about it. And a lot of the physical and mental health stresses that they're experiencing are actually directly related to poverty and a lack of ability to participate in life and to have positive choices available to them. And it's a really harrowing experience as a clinician or GP who really loves and wants to serve your community because you're quite helpless. You're sitting, listening, you're holding someone's pain with them, but you can't fix it. And this is a kind of story I heard, I've heard um, a lot in the third sector and charitable sector too. Um, citizens advice, food people who work, uh, food bank, city council, workers, this kind of sense of helplessness 
um, in the face of the scale of the poverty emergency. Poverty limits people's ability to participate in society. It foreshortens lives and the impact on the whole of society is grave. It's not just a problem for those living with poverty. It's a problem, for obviously, the whole, all of us. I think currently, although poverty has returned somewhat to the national agenda, top down political responses to deepening poverty are focused on short term solutions, sort of sticking pasta responses to try and tie people through. But mainstream debate continues to treat people in poverty, living with poverty as the problem a lot of the time, rather than understanding poverty as a social issue of economic injustice and as an outcome of designed inequalities, as I've tried to show. And one of the things I've been going back to recently and thinking about is poor people's campaigns, particularly Martin Luther King's poor people's campaign for economic justice in the US in the 1960s and the language that he used at that time to try and mobilise this idea that poverty is not a private tragedy, but actually a public crime. But I could talk about that too much. I'm going to move on. So we need to account for the disproportionate impact of the disappearance of the 20th century welfare state on those at the losing end of British class society, working class children and young people, low paid women, especially working class women of colour, disabled people, those living at the margins of Britain's increasingly punitive citizenship and residency regimes, including precarious migrant workers, asylum seekers, and I think they're often missing in the poverty discussion. In 2023, the uh, APP group Child of the North reported that child poverty rates were soaring um, and they're focusing on northern England, but they're seeing upwards of 40% of children in some northern English towns now growing up um, in, in poverty. They describe a child poverty e epidemic. Um, and they talk in this report about the disastrous effects of this, which will last for generations. But this report also draws attention to this, this the geography of poverty, if you like, and its unevenness, its concentration in post-industrial regions within cities, uh, such as London, where there's pockets of extreme wealth and deprivation, cheap by jowl. But also, and the JRF data does this too, it shows us how poverty is clustered within particular demographic groups, households of a disabled family member, families headed by a single parent, families with three or more children, and we know why that is now. Non-white households are hugely overrepresented in contemporary poverty statistics. Evidence, I think, of the extent to which racial and economic injustice are utterly intertwined Particular ethnic and racial groups are significantly overrepresented. Black British, which includes um, Asian Caribbean, Bangladeshi British, Chinese British, Pakistani British, and Gypsy Roma and traveller communities. So I think there's something else here that's not um, where there's a real research gap, which is actually how regional histories of post industrial decline and connected histories of empire colonialism and post-colonial migration, borders, citizenship controls are have shaped and are kind of very physically present in the current poverty crisis. And they're part, I think, of a kind of missing histories of poverty that we need to better understand. What's also often missing uh, or in particular ways is people's experiences of what living in poverty in 21st century Britain means. But also, I think more than that, the expertise of people living in poverty, their theoretical insights into the state we're in uh, are too often missing. And they're missing from debates about what the political and policy solutions might be. And one of the reasons they're missing is the shame and stigma associated uh, with finding yourself in poverty, 
We know that concealed between behind the sorts of headlines and statistics that we read about are millions of individual stories of anger, misery, shame and wasted human potential. As one child put it in an evidence session to the APP, Child of the North, these graphs are people. I'm a number on these statistics. Why does it feel like I don't matter? My sisters don't matter. And I want to think more about the challenge of those words, I don't matter. Welfare settlements represent, um, an, they're the kind of site of connection between people, politics, policies. It's a kind of relationship. It's where the idea or practices of identities play out in the settlement of welfare. And the post-war welfare state didn't just provide a social safety net, it produced uh, or attempted to produce a destigmatized systems of social relief and structures of care. And these are a site of imaginary social investment. And the imaginary investment is actually really significant for what a welfare settlement means. So it's easy to romanticize the 20th century welfare state, and I don't want to do that. But I do want to pick up on the kind of utopian hope or horizon that motivated the architectures the architects of that state. And I always think about Caroline Stedman's work and she writes, the historian, social historian, she writes at length about growing up as a child in the 1950s. She says, as a period when the state was practically engaged in making children healthy and literate. She talks about that utopian blush um, of the new era of state welfare and its concrete material benefits. The achievement, as she says, for a society to pour so much milk and so much orange juice and so many vitamins down the throats of its children for the height and weight of those children to outstrip the measurements of any decade before, which is literally what we're seeing now in reverse in the new data. But she said what it what she described as a new value system, what that meant as a working class child to grow up in that environment and she says my inheritance from those years is the belief that I do have a right to the earth I had a right to exist so this sense that a kind of wealth and um, the imaginary of welfare for want of a better phrase um, bestowed this sense that you mattered so I think the question for us, if British citizens are no longer collectively willing to meet these kinds of basic needs of children, disabled people, the elderly and other vulnerable citizens for shelter care, education, through state organised systems of wealth, wealth distribution, through taxation, then I think we need to ask what kind of state we're in. How do we describe that state, that state with skeletal social provisions? a state where provisions that do exist are so unequally distributed by geography, by class, by race. That is not a democratic state. What values does the state of affairs bestow to those increasing numbers of kids we know are growing up in poverty? So austerity is an antisocial anti-democratic movement. It signals an unravelling of the social contract between citizens and the state. And as we kind of live through austerity without end, currently it feels like that, a poverty crisis created by those who implemented austerity, but legitimated by top-down stigma production across social and media space. It's crucial we listen to those who are resisting or struggling against poverty and stigma, who are fighting shame, demanding economic injustice for themselves and their children. We have to think about how we shift the dial and create a new consensus for economic and social justice. So I've been working, I am coming to an end now, I've been working with Joseph Roundtree Foundation over the last year, exploring precisely this question. How do you shift the dial on poverty stigma, which for me would encompass all these different scales from top down to its impact uh, or how it's embodied and lived by people living with poverty. How do you shift the dial against this kind of more than a decade now?
of sort of stigma production. What does that mean and what does it look like? How do you reimagine welfare? I just wanted to say a few things. This is um, Nasrat, who I've been working with through the JRF, who's a community researcher from Tower Hamlets. And she describes poverty stigma as coercive control, which I think is a brilliant definition of how stigma operates in different spheres and, and feels as a kind of form of control. Hal, who um, works for Bromley City Council as head of economic development, talks about turning the dial and how, you know, and she's somebody who divide, designs local services. She talks about how do we consciously design out stigma? We've got to if we want welfare services to work. And Steve, uh, who I work, Arna, who's a community activist and youth worker with Beats Bus and Hall works with young kids. He's also part of this group. And he works kind of with young people and uh, in, in much more grassroots ways to think about, to get them to be able to express in a way um, what it means for them to live through the cost of living, to live kind of with poverty um, and how, you know, in a way, it's a kind of anti-stigma practice from below where he's getting them to articulate. They, it gives them a space to articulate their feelings about what it means to be living in this cost of living crisis with poverty. And I'm not going to play you at all, but I just have to play you a tiny bit of the kids who work with being a rap. Uh, it's their cost of living rap. And their names are here on the slide. I just love the way that Steve uses kind of arts practice with young people, you know, to to really get out the feelings that they have, which are quite private, often feelings or hidden feelings and are hidden often within family to kind of express their own anxiety. Um, and I think uh, these sorts of practices, if we think, try and think about them on a massive scale and connected ways are kind of sight of hope and, and, and change for rethinking uh, the welfare imaginary. So what I produced was a kind of menu um, for what I think a destigmatize, and I haven't got all the answers. <laughs> so, but what what would a kind of, and we're working on a manifesto in the JRF group at the moment, but this is my um, menu please give me more ideas but what would a destigmatized welfare look like what would a kind of new social contract be so one thing i think that's really important is actually shouting loudly about the current poverty emergency and thinking about how to do that in clever ways that are impactful that raise up the voices or amplify the voices of lived experience this is a kind of moment of exposure an opening, a breach potentially, which shifts the dial on the kind of um, ideology, the hardened stigma optics of ideolo uh, ideology of austerity. How do, how do you raise awareness, how, raising awareness of stigma politics and its impacts? So this might include thinking about things like these outpourings of fictionalized reality TV programs that in a way incite forms of hatred quite often against people living with poverty and forms of classism. How, what are the legal protections around that you might want to think about? What are the equality frameworks around poverty and classism? You know, there aren't any protections at the moment. So I think stigma politics, like calling it out that when it's very evidently in political speech, for example, and the, what the legal implications of that as hate speech might be. How do you create attitudinal change? What are the media strategic communication forces that you would need to do that? How do you kind of shift it so poverty is understood as everybody's problem? It is, we know that. We only have to talk to 
you know, anyone in the NHS to any and a school teacher teaching a primary school to know that poverty is a social problem. It's everybody's problem. And I think we need to think about anti-poverty movements as kind of intersectional and uh, across social movements. How do you involve people with lived expertise in, in, in redesigning services and policies so they don't experience the stigmatising encounters and humiliations in dealing with services? At every scale, how do you do that? Um, and deep listening, I think, is part of that. Can we reclaim the idea, the kind of utopian um, project of a cradle to grave? welfare system that's grounded in, an, in a notion of rights. Where do, where, how can we reclaim that or reimagine that for this century? How do you communicate or get across that idea that health, education, social care services are public goods? How do you build trust back, restore honesty, accountability and ethics in public life? How do you redistribute wealth? What does tax justice look like? Taxation as an ethical public good, renewing democracy, funding locally, making participation in politics and in at local levels, meaningful and rewarding. For me, this means turning the dial also on migration, reframing migration as part of the solution for social change and social renewal and supporting international human rights frameworks, particularly around asylum and immigration processes. Um, so those in those systems can also access welfare in the same ways as other residents. So there's some things on my utopian me menu. And I'm gonna finish now with some another community group that I'm really love being part of uh, called Sewing Cafe Lancaster who make banners. Um, they're kind of an intersectional movement of their own and they, they do sewing and banner making. This is one of their banners, Policies for People, Not Profit, which are uh, designed by Victoria Frausen that I love. So I want to end with that image. Thank you very much. Thank you, Imogen. And please join me in thanking Imogen for this really inspiring and just really rich and interesting talk. And um, your, your work, coming so close to social justice and activism is just so inspiring for us at our research centre where we have had a long tradition of doing engaged research and are thinking about questions around health justice and health inequalities um, every day, all the time. <laughs> so it's really amazing and inspiring to see the work you're doing. <coughs> um, we've got 15 minutes left for questions and we've just made the decision not to have the questions captioned so our captioner can, can stop now because I know she needs a break. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have to actually hand it over to Chris because I'm on my phone on Teams and I can't see hands up or anything like that. Chris, is it OK if you just keep an eye on who has questions and, and call on them to ask so, and lead the discussion? Is that OK? Yes, yes, absolutely. I can do it. OK, so please, if you have any questions, um, you can raise your virtual hand and Chris will call on you or you can type into the chat, which I also cannot see, but Chris will monitor. Yes. Okay, so Hannah, please go ahead. Hi, Imogen, that was a fantastic talk. I enjoyed it so much. Um, and your and the ideas at the end were really quite inspiring about the destigmatization and so forth. And I really would like to know more about those. But my question is, um, how do you think things are going to change now that lots of people who haven't been traditionally part of this shame group are going to be brought into poverty through the cost of living crisis, specifically homeowners and mortgage owners? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that that's part of what I described as the breach in a way that, um, so if you talk to people who have been living with poverty for quite a long time certainly from the beginning of austerity if not longer they're like the cost of living crisis makes is meaningless to them because they're, they're just in the same poverty they've been in you know for a long time so it's like they don't they can't see any difference a lot of them uh certainly like communities through um some of the groups through poverty truth you know that 
that I've talked to. So there is this new group who are falling into, you know, struggle. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the hopes would be is like how many people would have to be living and struggling, living with poverty in order for it to make a change. The hope would be that that would create some kind of shift or change or breach that would open up these questions and would say actually this you know the enough is enough movement would be a good example I guess one of the concerns for me around what's emerged so far is like the enough is enough movement is that it's a kind of movement for which is great for greater pay and working conditions etc but actually in a way the groups that are missing remain those who are disabled, who are waiting endlessly in a waiting list and becoming disabled through that process, who've been disabled maybe by COVID, who uh, children aren't, you know, um, so elderly people. So I, I worry about the focus around the worker in, in the current discourses uh, and the kind of, you know, the focus on unions, which I think is fantastic, but I, I worry that we're not seeing those groups who don't fit into that but yeah I, I I in a way I think it I know it's a very depressing paper in lots of ways it's partly why I wanted to end with Victoria's banner because I do think we're at a moment of change um or we're at a moment of opportunity the question is how do you galvanize that change and how it has to be about welfare it can't just be about pay and work it has to be about you know, demanding the, for me personally, thinking through an abolitionist lens, we don't need to have any poverty. How do you abolish? How do you have, what would it mean to actually abolish poverty, not moderate it? You know, well, how do you work towards a kind of much more utopian horizon? And it might mean things like basic income, etc., as kind of policy planks, a shift there, massive shifts around things like housing, etc. But we can't, in a way, what we had has gone. It's been destroyed so much of it. So it's thinking about how do you get in to influence these debates, let amplify the voices of people with lived experience that we don't end up just in a kind of horrific, privatised solutions uh, market. But I haven't got the answer, but I think it's a moment of hope in a weird way which is horrific, of course. Okay. Um, I have a question <laughs> and I see no hands, so I'm going to use the uh, abuse a little bit my new responsibility. Um, my question is about protest and uh, what role do you see um, protest playing, especially considering, like I come from Chile, we had a massive amount of protest, kind of every six, seven years, full scale. And, and you can see that kind of protest activity in many parts of the world, even with less damage than the damage you've seen in the UK. And I always wonder so what, what holds that? And do a stigma has some role in that or emotions or shame maybe. So I wonder if you could reflect on that. I mean, I suppose one of the reasons why I think in my work, I try and focus at least some of the time on, I'll try and think at all these different scales is because I think uh, the role of media, for want of a better term, for all of those communication forms uh, in terms of, um, supporting a kind of neoliberal common sense in producing, for example, propaganda around welfare and poverty. There's such powerful, uh, you know, there's probably about five global corporations that control a vast amount of media that people read, consume, watch, etc. Uh, and, and often control the same very small number of people control social media, etc. And you just find this kind of uh looping processes happening very often there'll be a large-scale protest whether that's local or national and it won't even be reported uh anymore uh or even register uh even though people may be recording it on the phones and 
you know it's it, it's like it's not penetrating that media sphere so I think one of the big questions for me in response and I haven't got the answer would be what to do about the political and co- in the corporate uh, and they're in bed with each of the control of media in terms of um, the effectiveness of things like protest. I think my other question would be what constitutes protest? Um, you know, like how, how do people, so, you know, perhaps resistance would be a better term for me. How do people navigate the sort of welfare and poverty landscapes that they find themselves living in? How, what are the kind of tactics and strategies that people use to get by um, and, you know, subvert and resist the kind of designed inequalities that are um, enveloping their lives. Um, So I think there's another way in which we need to think about strategies of resistance that that are already taking place and happening and how do you, how do we, um disseminate some of those strategies um so yeah two two answers because i think yeah but i think media the control of media propaganda is a big thing but you know they're all connected you know like what does it mean to renew democracy in a context where there's so little difference very often between what's on offer politically um there's lots of good examples of local models of doing politics differently. The much lauded Preston model, which is just down the road from where I live, you know, where there's a local authority, a local council trying to uh, int- reintroduce cooperatives, a new idea of a kind of cooperative Preston as a city. So there are lots of examples of these minor changes, but they, they can only, I think, get so far until they're kind of cutting through a much higher level. I haven't got very good answers to that, I'm afraid, but more questions. Yeah, and we have more questions here too. So we have Christian and then Becky and then Robin. So go ahead, Christian. Uh, thanks for that, Imogen. That was great. Nice to meet you. So, so I'm, um, I work across Devon County Council and um, NHS Devon. I was going to ask a question about Preston, so it's good that you referenced that. <laughs> Take that bit out of my question. Uh, the, the, the the bit I so what, one of the things I'm really interested and concerned about is I guess a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, um, economic orthodoxy is based around a, a sort of trickle down economics and and I guess thinking about Morkham in particular and the recent announcement about um, Eden of the North um, in Morkham and that brings in lots of property money. Um, uh, speculation doesn't it and extraction i suppose of the wealth um of more I, mean, I guess i guess something about the challenge of how do we what what a bit like preston what might the opportunities practices be about how we can locally um think about how people can participate equally in that community wealth building and what tips you might have about where you're at in Morecambe? yeah it's a really good question and actually it's one of the questions that we explored in the first Morecambe Bay Poverty Truth Commission before we knew Eden had got the um, the contract um, and that, that was going ahead was, you know, what does that mean for local people in terms of they're living in quite a low cost housing area in a very beautiful place at the moment. So although there may be issues with poverty and certainly with services uh, like NHS and defunding of those um, those sorts of welfare services, you know the prospect of then you know places being gentrified and sold off um and being able to not afford to live there anymore are are a real prospect and i yeah one of the things that i know has been and probably still being looked at is how you do sort of housing controls in an area like that as we've seen a little bit in places like cornwall for example but do they work or not and so it's it's a really good question about you know how do you do business like which you know in the this case is a sort of social enterprise type business like Eden how do you do that in a way that doesn't further disenfranchise people and take away that creates prosperity that can be kept within a community 
and I think you know there are you know Preston is trying to do that and provides us with a bit of a model you know in quite simple ways of how you keep a local economy more local but I think that needs to be scaled up massively in terms of how and, and, and uh, radically and in terms of how we think about the economy itself um, I guess and for me that you know, is also questions of the environment. How do you, how do you bring these questions around poverty and inequality into conversation with something like environmental crisis? How do you connect them? How do you think about what living a good life means? There's all these bigger questions around how do you re-embed the, how do you re-embed the economy in society at a kind of local level and an, and at a national level actually? How do you just re-embed the economy? in a way that is not a kind of uh, a growth economy that's leading to the kind of climate change that I think is pretty apparent right now um, all around us as well. There are massive questions and I don't think I'm answering your questions, but I think there's lots of experiments going on. I think more and more we're seeing groups, communities, city councils, um, you know, in different ways kind of exper doing experiments in alternatives and it's yeah, I'd like to see much more conversation, you know, around connecting those experiments and those alternatives. But I don't think I've got an answer for you. But the sol the immediate solutions have to be local, but we can't pretend they're not national as well. Um, localism without changing what's happening at a national level, and in fact, beyond that, um, isn't going to work. Or it's only going to take you so far, I think. Sorry if that was a useless answer of things you already no, know. Not, not at all. It would, it would be great. <laughs> so we've, we've connected. So we're going to do a Poverty Truth Commission in um, Northern Devon. Um, so it's a great opportunity, I think, to kind of connect and learn from what you're doing in Morecambe. And we, we are connected to people in the poverty. I think, I think yeah, they're, they're really great moments of like, look, they're all, you know, for me, a Poverty Truth Commission is like a university in the community. You know, and, it, and it's getting rid of the them and us, which comes from the stigma politics of division and a way to kind of really think and learn from each of us expertise from lots of different perspectives in a community about what it could look like if you have um, people working together and pulling in the same direction. So they can be transformatory. But I think it's that thing of, you know, more of a good example of how far you could go around something like housing. There's going to be a limit if the national context doesn't change but yeah nice to meet you and good luck with your uh, commission Great, thank you nice to meet you i think the other thing i just said about that and it goes back to the process question is how joyful working with communities is so you know in terms of thinking about protest and resistance actually working with communities who are struggling is actually deep very often a deeply rewarding and joyful thing to do um you know so it's the most fun in a way you can have so it's worth thinking about how that also those practices are already kind of a space of hope and resistance they're already kind of anti-stigma practices um so yeah um, yeah thank you for that so uh, becky you can go great Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a, a really rich and fascinating, albeit depressing, um, talk, Imogen. I have so many questions. It sparked a lot, but I'm really going to limit myself because I think we're, we're probably quite short on time. So I was just going to ask two things very quickly. The first of all was um, in relation to some work that I'm putting together about health, place-based health inequalities and how we think about the histories of place mm. as contributing to health inequality. So it was really struck by your point about this really missing from the wider debate around poverty and for us we, we are trying to, when we see that as missing as well from the wider debate on health inequalities and I think part of that is about how do you get that? How do you get to, and and to to do that work on on histories to that background? So it's just wondering if you had any sort of insights as to those kind of key bits um, that that we should be looking at to include in that in relation to poverty. Um, and then the other very quick question was: I was recently reading Polly Toynbee's new book, and she she talks back about the 
actually the real push that New Labour had to do away with child poverty, that the promise they made, and she was really, I mean, from albeit in her particular position, um, reflecting on the, the actual really substantial changes that emerged through the New Labour government that were then all repealed um, back with the, with the coalition and, and um, then all these years of Tory rule. So then the last thing to say was, do you have any message for, for Keir Starmer or for the left in oh. terms of what, what what are the political things that could be going on that that should be written into future manifestos about really implementing change in this area so that they have something to say on the Today programme? Because at the moment they don't say anything. I don't know if I want to answer the last one because um, I'm just feeling frustrated around the politics moment. But um, I think for me, so another thing that I've been working on um, completely which is completely, I think, but not in an obvious way, connected to this work on poverty, is work since Black Lives Matter protests with a local community history group uh, called uh, Lancaster Black History Group. And Lancaster's got a very specific history, as a lot of the North West does, that's Atlantic facing, Liverpool and uh, being the largest slave trading port um, in the world um, in the 18th century. And Lancaster was a pretty significant, the fourth largest slave trading port. And it's a very hidden history. And actually thinking about histories that have been willfully, if you like, hidden, um, to me, you know, it's a really important thing to do in, in terms of reorientating us to the future. So if we think about the histories of you know, in this kind of ultra nationalist xenophobic context that we're current in. And if we think about empire and histories of empire, and we think about movement and migration of people from across the world into places like Lancashire, which was the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution, as we know, it was also the centre of a lot of the slave economies, as we know, but it was also where a million Irish people were migrated to to work in mills. It's where child labour was taking off in terms of um, children um, in the early period of the Industrial Revolution working mills. So we have these kind of histories of labour, poverty, movement, migration within Britain and to Britain through empire. And I think there's something about thinking about health but for me it's quite difficult to separate health from other things. So but health very broadly conceived um you know the health of population the health of people something about thinking with those histories through those like those lenses that we don't normally you know think about them through is so important for thinking about the future and doing it in a kind of way that isn't just through a national frame but is through a regional or local frame to understand the histories of the people who live in the place where you live, how they arrived there, how they lived, what the conditions were. You know, even teaching, I teach a course on called Welfare States, Histories and Futures, uh, where I take the students on a welfare walk of the city of Lancaster, where I live. And actually what we're looking at is the kind of pre, where the, you know, the existing, what remains of the architecture of the pre-welfare state, the almshouses, the, the former workhouse, uh, where the infirmaries were, how were they funded? You know, there's two asylums or the where in Lancaster at various point. Um, it was a kind of welfare town in a way. Uh, thinking about prisons, parks, sewerage, all of these elements of the kind of architecture of health and welfare and its history. And trying to get students to think about those pre-welfare state histories and philanthropy, who paid for it. Um, who you know just the industrial philanthropists and that to me is kind of a way to sort of widen the imagination about what welfare is and what it means but but I think for me the imperial turn as the historians want to call it is a central part of that you know, Britain wasn't a state before the 20th century it was an empire um and we you know we talk about the past like it was like an island nation you know it wasn't it was a huge place with huge movements of people internally and externally and that to me is part of rethinking health i guess it's thinking with those histories um if that makes any sense to you it, um i just think it's history for me is crucial for reimagining the future increasingly 
and a site of kind of inspiration um, and change. But I kind of guess I mean his doing history with communities, not just formal academic history. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you. OK, so we are above the time. We have the last question by Robin. So go, Robin. Just thanks, Chris. And thanks for such an amazing talk, uh, Imogen. Um, so my project's looking at some sort of similar processes um, and how they occur around women at the sort of poverty, health, criminal justice intersection, and um, particularly looking at narratives, health-based, health-raised narratives around court, and um, sort of a population that's perhaps even more stigmatized or, or even more the, the, the subject of that, those sorts of otherings. Um, you know, not only subject to that, Poverty, welfare stigma, but also criminalized for for whatever reason. And um, I guess, uh, yeah, the question was if if you had any thoughts about uh, sort of the criminal justice sector as as sort of uh, being deployed as the other side of the sort of welfare war crime, I guess. And um, and then yeah, and the sort of general uh, gender, criminal justice, poverty intersection. I think when we talk about austerity, I would really like to ban the word austerity and call it something else like it's such an unhelpful term for encompassing the scale of change that I've been kind of trying to describe so you know affect the welfare state is the state and the war we've had is against the, the democratic uh, redistribution of wealth and you know everything is the whole state but part of that has been attack on criminal justice system and particularly people's access to legal protections through um, criminal justice to the criminal justice system. So the, the defunding of the legal structures that protected people, citizens um, and, and, not, and non-citizens uh, in terms of the state, you know, is part of the process that I think austerity does, doesn't helpfully, the term doesn't capture. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's extremely difficult for people caught up in those systems to have access to a defence uh, now. But, you know, it's a kind of thing we see, isn't it? The increase in prison populations, the kind of lack of scrutiny, the kind of breakdown of systems of accountability around the conditions in prisons and confinement, etc. Like it's, you know, it's, it, it's systemic everywhere. I'm really interested in, and it, you know, obviously it travels in different ways, but I'm really interested in abolition as a kind of site of um, reimagining um, these carceral systems, the kind of prison industrial complex, which includes um, migrant detention um, as well as um, citizen detention. And I think we need to engage, you know, instead of going, oh, abolish the police, what does that mean? And walking away from abolitionist debate. You know, what abolition does, refers back to the previous question, is really relates the struggle to history and the histories of colonial capitalism and empire. What would abolition look like? Not, you know, there's a US debate around abolition, but what would it look like in a British specific kind of context in terms of British history? What does abolition look like? How can we think about it? So I think that's the most interesting kind of site is you know, poverty and the criminalization of poverty, you know, always have gone hand in hand um, with each other, um, obviously. But, you know, prisons are not the solution. And a kind of defunded prison service where there's no care, where it's locked down 24-7, where there's no proper probation services, etc. Um, where there's no support, there's no, you know, that isn't welfare or helping anyone. Um, so, yeah, I kind of, you know, very much leaning towards and inspired by abolitionist debates around uh, criminal the prison system but I would like there to be a much more funding for legal protection and people's access to legal aid and for that to be restored and restated you know whatever we think about the legal system without it 
you know, we need a strong legal system to protect us and to have a kind of functioning democracy. And I do believe in um, democratic, that that's, that's what we should be aiming for, is deepening and enriching democracy. And, and um, so that's a bit of a vague answer. Um, but I'm glad there are people doing research on this because I think it's really unbelievably hidden uh, what's happening in our prisons at the moment. Thanks for that. It's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, Emojen, for your time. Uh, thanks everybody for staying in the meeting. Uh, we had a lot of issues at the beginning and we had even to move to Teams. Um, but it was a fascinating meeting, super inspiring. I, I suggest everybody to read Imogen's books, they're amazing. Um, great work and I'm, I'm sure that as a centre we will continue to have links with you, hopefully work together. Yeah, I, I've, re I've, been, I've been really inspired by all of your work. Uh, you know, I've, as I said, I've been head of department during the pandemic, so I've not been very, I've done lots of engagement work, but I haven't been very active at all in terms of writing and research. So I've been catching up and, and re listening to your podcasts and finding out about your projects has been really inspiring to me. And um, yeah, so thank you very yeah. much too for everything you're doing. Yeah, and unfortunately, Luna had to leave the meeting, so. Uh, but but she she will be also in touch uh, directly. So thanks everyone. This was the last seminar of the uh, term. Uh, so we'll see you again uh, next next term. Thanks for stepping in, Christian. Uh, I'm sorry yeah, sure. everyone, for the technical difficulties, and I hope you all have a lovely weekend when it comes. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.